This Saturday, Ukraine has won 2022 Eurovision Song Contest. This might not sound like anything special, but in fact this is a significant morale boost for the country and especially its soldiers. What is this victory all about? Why is this so significant? And what was the reaction of both Russia and Ukraine? And these are the questions that we'll be talking about in today's video. What's up investors, Captain Sewer Rat and people of Reddit, it's the Russian dude and this is your daily update on Russian-Ukrainian war as of Monday, May 16th. You can see the main events of the day to my right along with the timestamps. This Saturday Ukrainian Kalush Orchestra has won the 2022 Eurovision Song Contest and I extend my sincere congratulations to the country. For those of you who do not know what this is, especially if you're from North America or South America, this is basically a song contest for each European country. What basically happens is that each European country selects one performer and sends them to this song contest. And then the professional judges as well as the regular people vote for the best song. This might not sound like anything extraordinary, but in fact winning in this contest brings an extreme sense of pride to the winning country. Which as you can guess is extremely important to Ukraine at this very moment and not just to the people of the country, but to the soldiers as well. Because as you can already see, Succeeding in the war is not just about which weapons you have, it's also very much about the morale of your army. And it is 100% certain that after Ukraine has won in this song contest, the morale was skyrocketing. Even the president of Ukraine, Vladimir Zelensky himself, congratulated Kalush Orchestra and the people of Ukraine with this victory. Some Ukrainians even claim that this song has become an unofficial anthem for this war. But the reaction from the Russian site, which by the way was not invited to this song contest, was something that you would expect. The main narrative was that oh poor Ukrainians, they're having this war so that all the other European countries will have to vote for them. They even said that the real winner of this song contest will be the country which will be on the second place, which by the way was the United Kingdom. So it looks like that even here Russia cannot accept that Ukraine has won plain and simple. They were showing many evidence that the voting has been rigged and even hacked. Or another popular narrative was that like, okay, let Ukrainians enjoy this victory because we're gonna defeat them very soon. But besides winning in this song contest, Ukraine also took an opportunity to raise the awareness of the situation. For example, the background for their performance was resembling the flag of Donetsk region, which at this very moment is one of the hottest areas in Ukraine. Another thing they did is that after their performance, they said save Mariupol safe as of style, which according to Google Trends indeed increased the awareness about this city. It has also been reported that some countries and of course Russia tried to protest this statement because they said this is a song contest, this is not a political arena. But long story short, the organizers of Eurovision song contest kinda ignored them. And by the way, if you like this style of daily news reporting, feel free to like this video and subscribe to my channel. Also, please make sure to check the link in the description if you want to receive additional content and support Ukraine with us. Thanks so much and let's continue. Welcome to another episode of Ridiculous Russian Propaganda and today we have two other small episodes. First of all, as some of you might know, several let's call them movie making companies has left the Russian market. And this means that several movies, for example from Marvel or Sony Pictures, are no longer being broadcasted in Russia. And so in one of Russian cinemas, the organizers decided to avoid this restriction by doing something very interesting. They are currently broadcasting two prohibited movies, Sonic and Batman. And they changed the names of these movies. So in this Russian cinema, Sonic is now called Blue Hedgehog 2. And Batman I think is even funnier, so Russian Batman is called Flying Bat. So now let me know in the comments which movie you want to see, Blue Hedgehog 2 or Flying Bat. And the second funny story is about the Russian teenager who was wearing Stone Island clothes. And as you can see right here, the Stone Island logo looks very close to the logo of NATO, which obviously Russia doesn't like. So the police stopped this teenager and they started questioning him. And the main idea behind this questioning was like, do you like NATO and why do you hate Russia? And the guy was like, no, you do not understand, this is the logo of Italian clothes brand. Well, the police did not buy it and 
they confiscated his clothes. On this map presented to us by the Defense Intelligence of the United Kingdom, we can see the current state of the war. And as always, the main combat action is happening in the east and south of the country. One of the biggest achievements of the Ukrainian army in the last few days is that they were able to completely liberate the region of Kharkov. And in addition to liberating it, Ukrainian soldiers even reached the border with Russia. And at the same time, according to the advisor to the president of Ukraine, Alexei Arestovich, the main goal of Russia at this very moment is to take full control over Lugansk region. And in order to do this, Russia is doing its best to capture the city of Severodonetsk, which is considered to be the capital of Lugansk region, which is still occupied by Ukrainian forces. And according to the governor of Lugansk region, Sergei Gaidai, only approximately 10% of entire region is still under control of Ukraine. Which gives us an idea that Russia, after all, might be able to capture this region. Which, by the way, according to different sources, is now the main goal of Russia in this special military operation. At first, the main goal was not to let NATO expand its territories, where Russia completely failed by letting Finland and Sweden join the alliance. The next goal was to liberate the east of Ukraine, specifically the region of Donbass, which includes Lugansk and Donetsk. But then apparently even this was too complicated. So now Russia decided to focus at least on one part of this region, which is once again Lugansk region. And I'm assuming if Russia is able to liberate this region, this is when Russia can finally announce its victory. Another important thing that happened recently is that the most injured people from Azov-style steel factory in Mariupol started to be evacuated. Just as a reminder, this city is the most destroyed city in entire Ukraine, with approximately 90% of its entire infrastructure being completely destroyed. And the only last territory which is still not under control of Russian forces is the territory of this factory, where in the past Ukrainian soldiers and Ukrainian civilians were hiding. But then, during the last couple of weeks, all the civilians were able to be evacuated, and Russia continued doing its attacks and bombings against the factory, which did not let the survivors of Azov battalion to get access to food, sleep or even basic medical attention. All this was a natural hell for those people for the last months. And today, once again, the most injured soldiers were able to be rescued from this factory. The Russian side says that these soldiers from now on will be the prisoners of war of Russia. And in the meantime, Ukrainian side says that these soldiers were exchanged for Russian prisoners of war. As you can see, basically as always, there are always two sides to each story. But the main thing is that finally these people started to get medical attention. In this picture, we can see the bodies of Russian soldiers, which Russia does not want to take back. One of the main slogans of this war from Russian side is своих не бросаем, which basically means we don't leave our own behind. And now we see the bodies of Russians actually being left behind. Ukraine doesn't want them and Russia does not want to acknowledge that these are dead people. So as a result, these bodies are just being contained in the one big refrigerator. Today was the meeting of ODKB country leaders, which is basically the equivalent of post-Soviet NATO. And the participants were the leaders of Russia, Armenia, Belarus, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzia and Tajikistan. The main purpose of this meeting was obviously to discuss the situation in Ukraine. And it also gave another chance to Vladimir Putin to justify his actions. They were mainly talking about how they can prevent the spread of Nazism across entire Europe, which according to them obviously originated in Ukraine. And they also agreed that the country's participants must have mutual military training somewhere this fall. Another important thing they all agreed upon is that country's participants will not join this war, but they will remain in the status of observers. And another, let's call it, interesting thing that happened happened is that Vladimir Putin said that he does not have a problem about Finland and Sweden joining NATO. But then he also added that in case NATO decides to expand its territories, this will obviously trigger the response from Russia. So it basically looks like, oh, so you decided to join NATO? Okay, we don't have problem with this, feel free, go ahead. 
but if you decide to join NATO, we will have to fight you. And by the way, Finland already officially declared that they will be joining NATO. And it is also expected that the country of Sweden will also announce the same decision somewhere in the very near future. In this picture you can see, for example, how significant the extension of the border between NATO and Russia will be as soon as these both countries decide to join the alliance. Russian officials obviously do not like this, so the only thing left for them to do is to continue making these provocative statements. For example, this Russian government official Alexei Zhuralev said that in case Finland decides actually to join NATO, Russia will destroy it. He then also added in case there is a threat to Russian territory, Russia will have to use the nuclear weapons. And I mean, that's not the first time Russia is threatening with nukes, so we can just ignore it. And the second statement was by this guy Adalbi Shakoli, who is the representative of Russian parliament. He said that as soon as Finland joins NATO, this will inevitably lead to a total bankruptcy of the country. And I mean, the way Russian propaganda works is that they take these statements from completely unknown politicians that came out of nowhere and they present it as the main statement of entire Russia. But at the same time, here we have the statement from the president of Turkey, Recep Erdogan, who said that the country will not be able to approve and say yes to Finland and Sweden joining the alliance. What I think he meant is that Turkey will not interfere in case this process will start, but at the same time this is the official position of Turkey, so that they can keep the diplomatic relations with Russia. So basically, how we say it in Russia, Erdogan is trying to sit on two chairs at the same time. The French car manufacturer called Drino announced that it is leaving Russian market. And so Russia decided to privatize the Renault factory, which is located in Moscow. And from now on, this factory will be used to produce one of the earliest Ladas called Moskvich. For those of you who do not know, Moskvich is this car, which was produced by USSR and then Russia, starting from 1946. And now, when the world is slowly switching towards electric and hybrid cars, Russia will once again start producing the car back from 1940s. I mean, I hope this car will at least have some kind of modern features, something like at least the AC and power windows. The United Nations think that if this war continues for at least one more year, approximately 90% of Ukrainian population will be below poverty line. The way it is justified it is because during the war the majority of production inside Ukraine has stopped. Many people either lost their jobs completely or they are working just part time. And in addition to that, Ukraine will need billions of dollars in post-war reconstruction. This statement is also confirmed by the Minister of Finance of Ukraine, Sergei Marchenko. He says that if the war is not over in the next three or four months, Ukraine will have to cut pensions and reduce salaries. Which once again gives you a perfect understanding how important it is for Western countries to send weapons to Ukraine as soon and as cheap as possible. Last week the European Union was not able to agree upon the sixth package of sanctions against Russia. And the main reason for this disagreement is because the country country of Hungary did not support the full embargo on Russian oil. They said that because of this, the economy of the country might suffer significantly. So today, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Hungary, Peter Sijarto, said that Hungary will require 18 billion euros in case they decide to stop importing Russian oil. And this money will go towards stabilizing gas prices as well as renewing the energy sector of the country. So it looks like that at this very moment, this is the required from Hungary to support the sixth package of sanctions. Many young Russians across the entire territory of the country are setting on fire military enlistment offices. And this is their way of basically protesting the war in Ukraine. So they literally take these Molotovs, throw it in the building and hope that this will destroy some documents. So as you can see, not every single Russian wants to fight against Ukraine. Thank you so much for your attention, check the link in the description, stay safe and see you tomorrow.